attention, everybody. Um, it's fallen to me rather at the, at the last minute to introduce John Fraser. Um, unfortunately, Susanna Hagen, who was um, due to introduce, was un unable to be here at the last minute. Um, which is so it's a little bit of a it's a task really to introduce John, um, but I'll give it a shot. Um, John, as the description really says, has been a pion pioneer in the development of intelligent and interactive building systems and evolutionary design computation for over 30 years. His research has been developed at the AA, um, in particular Unit 11, in the end of the 80s and early 90s, um, the Cambridge Computer Laboratory and the University of Ulster, and um, during the last eight years in establishing the Design Technology Research Centre at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, his associations with the likes of architect Cedric Price, cybernetician Gordon Pask, and more recently the city of Groningen, um, represent an individual who embraces enthusiastically and tirelessly what he calls multiple possible future design trajectories. Um, through the development of a theory of a truly integrated design process. Um, I'm not going to even to attempt to wrap that up in a nutshell because obviously John is going to talk about that. Um, but by way of a small anecdote, um, I was a student of John's in between 92 and 94, and um, which basically prepared me to go out into the world and set up a business making coffee and designing coffee bars which I did for about five years, um, and also hosting a number of rather fantastic events and exhibitions while we were making cups of coffee. Um, but this in turn then prepared me for working with Cedric Price for three and a half years on a book of his work. Um, and I think my time spent at the AA with John and then possibly making cups of coffee um, and then with Cedric was critical in um, forming my understanding of what architecture could be, um, presenting it in entirely non-aesthetic non terms, but rather as a system of values to be questioned. Um, and now I'll hand over to you, John. Thank you very much, Sam. The crowbar sounds far too modest. The crowbar was the best coffee bar that London ever had and much, much regretted in its passing. We're going to start on the beach. We're going to do a thought experiment, three thought experiments if you've got the stamina. The first thought experiment is a kind of idle question. You know, if you had computers, what use would they be to an architect? I mean, computer-aided design is pretty self-evidently useless. However, there is this powerful kind of machine um, imagine you've got endless computer power, infinite capability, software that actually works, does something useful, interfaces that mean you don't have to use your fingers and mice. What would you do with it? How would it improve architecture? How would it improve life on this planet? And so that's the first thought experiment. So we start on this beach. Now that beach is not quite what it looks like. It's made of coral. And that coral comes from the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef, huge construction, several thousand kilometers long. And it formed of a series of coral atolls, islands inside coral reefs. The islands, of course, are made of bits of broken coral. We have total systems here. The trees find a way of surviving in such a curious climate by interesting design strategies with their roots. And of course, they in turn bind that coral into a more stable system. The coral reef itself, the coral grows out of the water where it's broken by the waves and the winds. So we have an immediate environmental interaction with the waves, the winds, the tides, which of course are themselves due to the sun and the moon. The other inhabitants of the reef, the fish, also play a crucial role in this total system. The coral itself, this is called staghorn coral, exhibits 97 different, clearly identifiable different architectures. So question one for you, who is the architect of this coral? <laughs> who designs it? Who built it? And, and how do they know what the blueprint is? And the answer is the little polyp. However, it may be just giving the polyp too much of a favor to suggest that it is terribly conscious that it's making staghorn as opposed to the other 96 odd varieties. However, that little polyp, which you can barely see, thrives away, builds the coral, which builds the reef, which the w waves interact, which builds the atoll, which builds this vast structure. The biggest construction on the planet. It's even bigger than the Great Wall of China. 
So what are we to learn from that sitting on the beach and thinking about this? Well, there's another step to this, which is how did the, how did the polyp get there? Well, the polyp, the geometry of the polyp is defined, or its characters are defined by DNA. On the left is the original model, 50 years old this year. I keep saying happy birthday DNA, but I'm going to repeat that one. On the right is a slightly clearer model showing the pairs of nucleotides that form the information system that generates all the variety of human behavior and form we see in this room, not to mention the trees outside in Bedford Square, not to mention the 99.999% of the population of this planet which you can't even see. It's a humbling thought for a start. Um, I just remind you that actually that the biggest things, like the dinosaurs, are already obsolete. Um, the whales, the next biggest thing, are well on their way out. Then elephants aren't, aren't, haven't got many of them left. The next biggest thing after that in giraffes is going to be human beings. I need to think about that. Um, but in the meantime, we're talking about the process by which we get from the DNA to the coral reef. And now this is a very long, drawn-out um, 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 problem. That's frog spawn, in case you don't recognize it. You used to get this as school kids at school, and that's a... Um, tadpole halfway to being a, a frog. Now nature works from that single cell seed through a process of, of cell division um, and symmetry breaking. Nature doesn't acquire symmetry, it breaks it. You can see there quite a lot of residual symmetry in the tadpole, as you can see if you look at me. Um, flowers, everything else, has residual symmetry. They don't acquire symmetry, they lose it. With increasing complexity, they lose that inherent order. Um, I always put this slide in. This is for those who know my lecture. Um, the spinach and the goats. On the left are my goats or kids, baby goats. Um, there are several points about this slide, one of which is it's behavioral. They're playing king of the castle. They're programmed biologically to find the highest possible point and then pay king of the castle and press push your sibling off it. In this case, the highest available mountain is my gate post. Um, nature has evolved from the most wonderful device for gripping on slippery stone, which is a cloven hoof. Um, it defies imagination as to imagine how this works so well, but believe me, it's brilliant. And it evolved. Um, another few things about this. We're talking about two different things in nature which we must understand and separate at this point in the talk. One is the growth from a single cell that you start out of when you're conceived to the complexity of cell division that causes you to be as you are, some 50 or so roughly divisions creating billions of cells and the evolutionary process that leads to the goats existing in the first place. Um, just as a reminder, you're about 99% share your DNA with chimpanzees, about 96% with these goats. On the right is spinach, which of course contains similar DNA sequences. Um, you're about 30% spinach. 30% vegetable, I feel this quite strongly sometimes in the morning. So the process is getting from the seed on the left of the spinach. How do the instructions, we've got two different problems to look at. One is the epigenetic development, that is the growth or biological development from the seed to the plant. The other is the evolution of that plant over, uh, over millions of years. Every acorn makes an oak tree, every oak leaf is recognizably an oak leaf, however, every single oak leaf is different, every single oak tree is different, because of something else that's important in this. Even if the DNA is the same, the environmental conditions for the growth of the oak tree change, so the oak tree changes correspondingly. Some books on biology talk of DNA as being a blueprint. This is quite untrue, because a blueprint usually makes, or is supposed to make, the same building. Um, this is not true of DNA, it makes a different oak tree, it's recognized an oak tree, but it's different depending upon the environmental conditions, the light, what other trees are around, and so on. Um, so my self-imposed problem is what is the architectural equivalent? If we were to make an architectural DNA kit, what would it be like? What would be the equivalent of? We just manage, you can't just look at the economy of this. Four nucleotides describe all this variety. Everyone in this room, everything outside, the goats, the spinach, all these millions of things we can't see, are described with nothing more than the permutations of four nucleotides. The economy of that is devastating, or inspiring. What might be the equivalent is my uh, idle question. Um, now that is a snail shell. Now a snail is an interesting question, even um, in biological terms. The shell is is a phenotypic reaction. However. Um, it's not actually part of the snail. So it's what is, is known as an extended phenotype. 
That is, it's something that is a, an extension. Now, what is interesting about this is that the way that that shell responds to the particular availability of grains of sand or whatever in the, in the local um, culture and its understanding of how to make itself to camouflage is somehow in its DNA. However, that shell is not actually part of the snail. So I'd suggest that by extension, Dawkins argues that you have to treat things like beaver dams as an extended phenotype. Now, I'd like to stretch this point and suggest that for this evening's lecture, at least you bear with me the notion that a computer is an extended phenotype. We have extended this external artifact of ourselves, the computer, and, and there are people suggesting, and I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember this at this moment, who, that somehow nature contrived the notion that we should evolve computers as an extended phenotype because it realized that it couldn't evolve fast enough anymore to keep up with the mess that man was making. So it speeded up man to make computers so that the computers could solve the problem. This is not my argument, but you might like to just think about that in the background whilst I'm talking. Uh, so the computer's extended phenotype, massive computing power, allows the temporal compression of space and the spatial compression of time to accelerate the exploration evaluation of multiple future design trajectories, the word Sam was just using, design possibilities. I have this feeling that we have got to move far faster to de deal with both social problems and ecological problems on this planet. The nature itself can't respond fast enough to deal with the mess man is making, so even nature has to be accelerated. And I'll return to that point in a moment. I have to make one very clear point at this moment. I take a breath here and say I am talking literally about evolution. This is an evolutionary sequence, which I will explain in a few minutes. However, it is actually evolving. It is not some architectural analogy of that process. This is about as direct as it can be. Um, architectural history is bedeviled with biological analogies, some fun, some mischievous, some blatantly misleading, some simply wrong. Um, in this case, we're talking about a very literal interpretation of the concept of evolution. I'll explain that. But first, I have to give you some tools. Sorry, this does sound like a little bit of a, of a, of a, little bit of a science lecture. It won't last very long. The toolbox, or tool shed as Sam would have it, which worries me a great deal about what we used to do in the tool shed. Anyway, the toolbox, um, contains various things. There are five of these toolboxes. Toolbox one contains basically generative techniques such as cellular automata, polyautomata, rule-based systems. These are things that make things and grow and develop them automatically. And uh, I'll start with the universal constructor, which some of my students built with me here in the late 80s, being in the 90s. That's a three-dimensional cellular automata that some of you may be familiar with very simple two-dimensional ones like the life game, which have very simple rules, life, alive or dead or about to, about to exist. This is a 3D one. It has, in this particular case, 256 possible states for each cell. So it has many states between being alive and dead and include the possibility of these not actually being cubes at all. Uh, the spatial configuration, each one of these contains a computer. So this becomes a very complex, reconfigurable array processor able to understand, and I use that word carefully, and I may or may not have time to return to explain it less carefully or more carefully. Uh, however, at the moment, just bear with me the notion that there's something, there is a notion that this system understands where all its parts are because each part of this can interrogate its neighbors and discover. And indeed, anyone interacting with this can move these parts around and can configure it differently. And different members of my unit at that time use this in different ways. So some are using it to represent dance positions. Some are using it to represent architectural forms. Some are using it to represent very abstract things. So state 37 in here could be a dog. It could be the wind. It could be a position like this. Or it could be a Doric portico. It could be whatever you like. You can, you can define that. And I'll explain a little bit more how you do that in a moment. So when it's running, uh, each of these little cells has um, eight light-emitting diodes and a computer in board, and so it's comparing its position with its neighbors. It doesn't connect laterally. It goes up and down the stacks to make the connections simpler. But it's basically a machine that's able to talk to its neighbors, and it becomes a kind of architectural metaphor in this case uh, for um, a self-organizing system. However, from that, we can, we can, we can produce... Um, um, mapping to actual form. Let me show that. 
This is a sequence um, on my students. I won't read out the students' names. They're all captioned. The important thing about this sequence is that all the instructions from that came from the initial configuration of these cues. In other words, from that simple starting point, this is the configuration which is developing and, and builds rather improbably from a simple collection of gray cubes at the beginning, 16 slides later, it's turned into this complex kite-like form. This is highly misleading because actually it took him over a year to do this and there were 5,000 slides in between, but I thought 5,000 might be a bit much. But you see the point here, that this is a mapping sequence. So this is a, a developmental generative sequence. It's not yet quite true, this is evolving, and I'll explain the difference about that in a moment. Let me start with a later example, which is very simple to understand. This is a cubic-based system, one cube in the middle. And this cube is talking. This is a, a three-dimensional cellular automata, in this case with 16 million states. And it is talking to invisible environmental neighbors here and deciding whether or not to split, just like the cellular division from when you're conceived as one cell to build a complexity. This isn't going to build anything like as complicated as a human being, uh, but we don't yet have the processing power, which is an important point. So each cell is looking at its neighbors, its actual physical neighbors, and environmental neighbors you can't see, and from that is deciding whether to split and where to split and where to put the additional cells. In the first instance, all the cells are identical, just as they are in biological terms. However, uh, at a certain point in this sequence, you will find that the cells start to specialize, and you'll notice this because they start to change color and geometry. Instead of staying as cubes, they start to stretch and elongate themselves and so forth. Can you all hear at the back while I'm just running? Okay, fine. So there, there's another point about this, which I'll come to in a minute, which is that with something like the life game, the rules are embedded in the system. If you don't know the life game, it's a very simple two-dimensional cellular automata. Cells look at their neighbors, and if there are no neighbors, the cell dies of loneliness. If there are too many neighbors, it dies of overcrowding. If there are just the right number of neighbors, it can survive. And if there are a perfect number of neighbors, it can have a baby. Uh, that is a very simple two-dimensional array. We're not talking about anything like as simplistic as that. This is something which is re -dynamically, dynamically reconfigurable. You see now these cells are specializing. and They're taking their states, not just to be rules for transition, which are evolving, but in this case, they're using them to map to some change in the form. Is the basic principle of that clear, I hope? So I'm going to stop this. So a sequence like that is equivalent to the epigenetic development or the growth, say, of the acorn to one oak tree. Now, this particular piece of software was also able to evolve. So the next two slides are crucial because there are other outcomes of that same piece of software. But this time you'll see that they have evolved to be quite different because the transition rules about being alive, dead, and where you are have evolved and changed and developed um, in very close analogy to the way DNA would change. So you can begin to see, I hope, how the complexity of this sort of system can start to build. We've rebuilt that system several times, and the only reason to re-show you this is because only recently did I manage to get two of these systems to talk to each other. Here are two of these uh, special purpose-built computers um, talking to each other and discussing um, some kind of collaborative evolutionary and environmental condition, which I again will return to. Now, um, there's too much words on the slide. Let me just go to the pictures. Um, this is um, um, just to show you some idea of the complexity. First of all, note at this point we've got rid of the cubes and gone to spheres. Cubes are awkward. You have 26 neighbors, eight Eight, eight vertex neighbors, six face neighbors, 12 edge neighbors. 26 is too many to talk to. They're three different kinds. That's clumsy. Spheres are beautiful. Spheres packed with 12 round one. 12 is elegant. It's isomorphic, isotropic, isospatial. Doesn't matter which way up. You're all equidistant. It's lovely. And 12 is a lovely number to talk to. So we went to spheres. And this one, the, there is a one dimensional automata here making the rules to drive in time this way, and one is structure, one is environment. They are making the rules 
for this three-dimensional configuration, and that is making this shape through the middle, which is between the structure and the environment. So I'll just run a little movie of, of this for a moment. The movies are mainly for my benefit, so I can get a glass of water or a glass of wine, depending. Um, Uh, so you see this surface developing, but there's another reason for showing this sequence, which is I feel a sort of moral obligation to point out that, that there is a great danger in showing things which by and large in lectures are successful. Um, <laughs> it's important to warn anyone who wants to get into this that there are an awful lot of failures. Um, this is a spectacular failure. That was supposed to be an optimal solar surface. Well, without explaining too much how, I think anybody can see that couldn't possibly be an optimal anything. Um, so this is a kind of cautionary tale. That diabolical mess never got itself sorted after hundreds of runs of this program. And so the warning here is you can't expect these techniques to always work. Be careful. However, I will normally show successes. This is successful. This is another part of that universal constructor where it's driving motors. The original intention had been that the whole structure would be motorized. However, we didn't do that for all kinds of reasons. But this is driving a splining system, which is the beginning of making complex curved surfaces. We'd also intended to automate the cubes and couldn't manage that at the time. However, recently, um, some of my students in Hong Kong re-ran this same experiment with uh, Yasu, who's there, and managed to get this to work. And this is really quite elegantly done because of the difficulty of getting sensitive response. Um, I'm going to talk in a moment about interaction and how this occurs and how you interact with these systems. But here you see someone using their hand and gestures to get these, to choreograph the movement of, uh, of these uh, cubes in space. Toolbox 2. Evolutionary techniques. How do we get these things to evolve? Um, there's a technique I'm going to explain called genetic algorithms, which is very much like it sounds. It was invented by someone called John Holland. However, um, they normally develop these techniques for use in engineering, for optimizing turbine blades and airplanes. Everybody told me, you can't use these for design. Idiot Fraser, I've been told that so many times in my life because we were dealing with ill-defined problems and conflicting criteria, as you know from any design problem. However, it turned out that they work fine under these conditions. It's just engineers don't like conflicting criteria and ill-defined problems. So we'd use boats, which are pretty clear. So here is a boat evolving under genetic algorithm control. But there's a problem. They'll tend to get longer and longer and longer and thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, because there's a conflict. The hydrodynamics of the outside of the hull want it to be long and thin. The interior wants it to be broad and fat. That's um, a, a conflict. And the problem is that these algorithms, the engineers hadn't thought how to put this in. So we used um, two things. One is Darwin. Darwin himself, in chapter one, talked about variation under domestication. Um, I, I always ask people, how many people have actually read Darwin, and almost usually I get one or two, I don't know, I'm not actually bothering to ask you, but it, it, it really is unbelievably weird experience to actually read what he wrote. Um, and I've read it several times because he changed what he wrote in his six editions of the book and changed it quite dramatically, which is also interesting. But however, what he starts off with is this. He had this difficult idea of trying to sell the notion of natural um, selection. But he started off with which every, what everybody understood, which is variation and under domestication, or artificial selection. And he said, look, you all know, if you want to breed more beautiful Labradors, the breeder picks two or three beautiful Labradors and cross-breeds them. If you want to breed a horse, a faster horse race, you pick whatever. Two fast horse ra races, you have to be clever, because of course you can make one with a very fast but very weak leg, so the breeder has a lot of judgment, human judgment, in this process. And this is called natural selection. This has led to you know, hideous Pekingese and disgusting bulldogs and very beautiful Labradors and so on. So then Darwin says, now however, in chapter two, that is how natural selection works, but given um, a, a very much, sorry, whoops, 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 um, a very much more time. 
So this, this little chart here is absolutely crucial. The engineers, they were only in concern with their turbine blades, with convergent evolution by what is in effect um, uh, the natural selection of an understanding of an engineering description of something. You know, the, 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 the air flows faster over the turbine blade, therefore reward that gene and proceed. However, if you take um, Darwin's own uh, advice, there is also this possibility here of artificial selection. You as designer can go in and choose and select, or you as user, which is also crucial to my can go in and select. The other thing is you don't have to converge, you can diverge. Nature also does this. The one, one of the reasons it's believed that we have vast redundancy in our genes is to deal with the problem of changing environment. If suddenly something changes, then there are all this other genetic information available to suddenly start breeding subspecies and variants which might be more successful in those conditions. And so you can turn up the random number generator in these algorithms and get more divergence. So you can run for divergency, you can run converge, you can use your own skill and judgment, you can use the computer. So typically you will use a combination of these, which is very powerful. You can generate new ideas, you can generate variants, you can home in on a perfect solution, you can let the computer do its hard work, and you can step in individually. So by using all four squares, suddenly what is a rather dull engineering technique becomes a very, very powerful design technique. Um, these are not very interesting examples, but they show one of the most powerful bits of software we've at the moment got running, which is a full equation-based system. The reason is a bit odd is that these have been generated by some very brilliant computer programmers I have in China, However, they are computer programmers, and they also favor pagoda-style architecture. So if you <laughs> don't ignore the architecture and just look what's happening in the forms, because these are evolving. These aren't designed. Nobody designed these at all. These are being generated by the machine and being subselected by some user and or some algorithm. So that's very, very powerful software. And, and, and at the end of the lecture, I'll show an example of that being applied. In the meantime, I've got to get through my toolboxes quickly. Toolbox three is interaction. How do you interact with these systems? If it's going to learn from you, how does it know? How are you going to talk to these things? We, we, we regard it as self-evident that a keyboard and a mouse are just too idiotic for words. Um, we, we, we had a, an exhibition in 92 where we, lots of friends here you'll recognize, people like Brit and right? and um, all these familiar faces. Um, but what they're, what they're all doing is, is, is interacting with this set of exhibits. Each of the students made at least two devices, one input, one output, and we cross-wired them all. So uh, there you see all these different devices uh, talking to each other um, and, and visitors going in and discovering that by playing with something down here, that makes something else happen here, and that makes something else happen, and so on. So we just explored all kinds of other tactile and environmental ways in which you could communicate with um, some kind of machine intelligence. Underneath, the, it was set up as a, as a laboratory bench, as you can see. Underneath, there was a great deal of wire and a lot of computers. And then we had a rack, and each student had one or two circuit boards which they wired up themselves in this rack. And these racks enabled all these different systems to be cross-wired and communicate with each other. So any input device could drive any output device. So there were all kinds of things to do with sound. There was a full, oh, this, was a, this, was a, this, this joke's out of date, but at the time, Kipnis was here, and was battling on about folded structures, and they weren't half having a wonderfully bad time trying to get this stuff into the computer. So, so Tim, one of my students, built this lovely little um, folded mat, which has simple light sensors in it, and as you fold the mat, the computer automatically generated all the folded curves. So whilst everyone else was sweating for weeks trying to put these curves in, he was just sitting there bending his mat, getting all these lovely folded shapes. This is a bit of a tease, but it still makes a point about obviousness, which is, you know, if you want to make something folded, why not fold it, you know? Um, Pizzoelectric grass. This is grass. You touch it, and as the wind blows through it, or as you stroke it, it responds to the pattern of your the breath or the wind or your stroking. Um, Nicola with, with finger rings. This is just a three-dimensional cursor, but each one of these little joints which goes on your fingers has a little rear stat built into it. It's just like a data glove, except that it's kind of elegant and controls things in 3D space. Body suits, which you can touch and they vibrate, and you can have someone else in another one, and you can give them a massage, or they can give you one, or you, or you can get the wind. We cross-wire it and let the wind to give you a massage. 
Um, and we had responsive, this is based on a Fry Otto structure, just wires running through the structure, which um, very powerful electro, whoops, go back to the bottom base there, very powerful electro, whoops, uh, very powerful electromagnets down here, um, which cause these wires to, to pull, and this thing thrashes around very violently in that cage. And this went into different moods. Um, because we were sensing where everyone is in the exhibition, it was just in the South Jury Room over there, um, you, um, uh, if it sensed people near, it, w it would show off. If, if, if people walked away, it would thrash about to try and attract attention. Um, if no one went near it, it sulked. Um, finally, it thrashed itself to bits in what we saw as a fit of depression, because no one was looking. But anyway, all these different visitors, uh, uh, Ken Yang has appeared now, and Martial, and I, uh, were, were all, unbeknownst to themselves, giving each other massages and t tickling each other and all sorts of interesting things. Uh, but it was all just to do with exploring how to communicate with a machine. So we've got a problem there about interaction. This is an ongoing discussion about how to make things. Um, toolbox 4 is learning systems. These systems have got to learn. We're all far too lazy to program. Anyone anyway, waste of time. They learn. That's how we got to be how we are. Don't believe anyone who tells you that when the number of cells you can buy, or the neurons, in a computer in Tottenham Court Road exceeds that in your brain, it will necessarily be more intelligent. Not necessarily. Um, how is it going to know? Most of what you know, you inquire. Everything that got into your brain got there through your senses. What are the senses that are going to be attached to this little black box that will allow it to learn and understand? Well, we've just been talking a little about the senses, but now some learning things. Neural networks, intelligent buildings, and crystal computers. These are neural network experiments. These are basic attempts to build learning systems that which are much more like the human brain. Multicellular responses, and they're built in a neural uh, neural network manner, very much more promising for this kind of work than conventional computers like the one in front of me, which is serial in configuration. Basically, the serial computers, the ray processors, and our neural networks at the moment, and there may soon be a lot more. However, in terms of learning, the neural network is by far the, the most powerful. Then there's learning another way, and this is done the other way around, but this is for Cedric. And I, because Cedric um, was this memorial event the other day, I felt I had to include this project. Um, he built, or designed rather, the, this little reconfigurable system um, for, in Florida. A little basically porter cabins that can be moved around. There's a crane permanently on site ready to move these things about. The question is, how do they get their instructions? And the answer is, well, Cedric asked us, and it's me and Julia, to do the programming for him. You can see the date of this. Look at this. This is the first personal electronic transactor. That's the first time you've got a computer on your desktop like this. None of us believe now the, the, the millions of times more power we would have available so fast. That was an 8K machine. That is so little, you can't believe how little it was. You know, your watch, you know, the second hand has more intelligence than that. Your earring has more intelligence. I mean, and look, square keys, and that, that tape deck was the, that, no, the, the graphics 25 by 40. <laughs> so you have to use a plotter, a lab plotter, to get line output. Anyway, the important bit is here. This is a model of the corner of his site, and each of these things represents one cell of his structure. In that cell is a computer. The idea was that life-size, we would embed a computer into every single part of the structure, and those bits of computer would talk to each other, and as a result, they would um, design a building. So it was indeed Cedric's notion of the first intelligent building, not anything, just a bit of wire in it now. However, <laughs> there was too much computing power. Um, and so what happens if you're too intelligent? You get bored. So we proposed that the machine would get bored. So that the building, when it's moving here, the crane driver just got his instructions to move that cube. But he doesn't know whether that's because the user needed something different or because that cube simply got bored with being next to this cube here or didn't like its aircon output or something. So that isn't facetious. The reason for this is it's to do with provoking response. So there is a basis for machine learning. The machine can't learn anything unless it's got something to respond to. So that was the basis of this notion of, of, of boredom. Force it to cause an interaction. It's, um, Gordon Pask's example was that if you kick this, and it didn't, you know, it's just a lectern, and if it kicks you back, it's a responsive system. And we shouldn't anymore be in the, the realm of things that don't kick you back. You know, get it to, you know. And that's how to get some um, reciprocity with the environment, let the environment learn. And chemical computers, these are quite nice. These are computers that grow crystal structures, which are in effect a form of memory. And uh, 
Um, the, 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 I'll, I'll return to this one in a minute, but these are all exploring alternative forms of intelligence, memory, and computation. Toolbox 5, materialization. We've got to make this stuff. So first we're going to have a little digression into Ron Holland's boat building, then a little bit on responsive structures, intelligent structures, and so on. Ron Holland, in that little cottage there in the middle of the photograph, is his yacht design group. There's Ron designing some of the world's most beautiful and elegant yachts. Of course, he's got a vastly powerful intergraph system behind him, but however, that generates all the lines. But there is Ron. And what is he doing? He's inputting the lines by hand, by eye. And why? Because he trusts his intuition and judgment. So here is a very elegant example of the reciprocity between someone using their skill and judgment and experience and the vast power of those machines in his room, which then do all the curve fitting and the splining and the wetted air and all the calculations that ensure this yacht's going to perform well. So the computer does its bit, it does all the hard work, and Ron uses his experience and judgment and the two are a powerful combination. And then, more to the point, those instructions go to the shipbuilding yard. This is Germany, 7,000 kilometers away, and it's being cut to incredibly fine tolerances uh, with a laser cutter. So now we have the electronic craftsman. Um, designers lost connection with design, with, with um, any time they need to do drawings, basically, which were other very big things like naval ships, cities, um, or more recently with Industrial Revolution when they were going to make many things. This is ridiculous. The craft was originally in direct contact. The computer now allows us to re-establish that direct contact. So Ron is, in effect, building that ship um, from 7,000 kilometers away as if he's crafting it to very fine tolerances. Um, uh, this is both a, a kind of moment of kind of inspiration for architects to think how they might be constructing things in the future, but also a worry, because if architects don't get in there, they're going to finally lose it once and for all. They're finished. And why is it here? Because out there in the sea are the most changeable wind and weather conditions in the world. The wind changes, the weather changes so fast. It's perfect for testing. You get accelerated testing. And you have to test things back in the real world. All this computer modeling, it may not be right. So that's where, and that's how he got his skill and judgment and experience. We also played around with all kinds of other things, like um, electrological fluids, of course, making self-responsive structures. Um, these are quite nice. This is, this is this is glass with, with invisible wires etched across it. So there are little light-emitting diodes here displaying patterns coming in on this side, and there's no visible connection. There are no wires going to the diodes on this side. This is to do with invisibility and visibility and, and the question of how, how one is going to see and understand what's going on. Uh, also playing around with electrically controlled glass, touch-sensitive, and interactive structures. Um, this is a space frame, there's a membrane here which represents a wall. There are light sensitive diodes all over this and powerful stepper motors which are bending this structure as the light tracks. So at the back here, there is a light which is tracking backwards and forwards. And as it tracks, the light sensitive cells here bend and deform this structure and you see that displayed via shadows. This was to do with exploring ideas of, of building construction which, which was not just environmentally sensitive over a long time scale, but perhaps on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis. So when you go through the materialization phase, all these things become crucial. And the idea about intelligent data structures, there is a great elegance in having the um, computing system mirroring the data. In the middle there is the transputer, which at that time was the most powerful array processor in the world. But what was nice, it allowed connections to four neighbors. So each of this is a non-working model. We never had the money to make this. Uh, work, but this is a non-working model, uh, but, it, but the principle is clear that it, there is a geometrical correspondence between the computer model and the model which is physically representing the real world. So we're imagining a moment where every kind of, not just each part of the building, such as the, Walter, uh, the Cedric Price one, but each tiny structural element in the building will have massive computing power embedded in it, able, enabling it to respond on a, on a very fast uh, cycle. Right, so that's a few tools, very rapidly. Um, five toolboxes, there are many, many tools. But now we're going to give, give a sense of some applications. And we talked a lot about architecture as a form of artificial life. We ran this little exhibition in 1995, January 1995, where we talked about this notion um, of could we consider, was, it, was this useful to talk about architecture as if it were some kind of artificial life form? So that was the exhibition. Um, basically a series of boxes up the middle of the room. Um, and, and a lot of this electronics that you've already seen um, in those boxes. We made a little book to go with it, sadly now out of print. 
and we restored many of these models to working order. Um, now, the, the point about this story is that um, we got funding for this from the Arts Council, both for the exhibition and the book, but none of us had bothered to read the small print, and we discovered, or some probably cursed or someone discovered at some critical point, that we promised this exhibition would travel to six other venues. Oh, dear. Because inside there, there was um, Julia, who'd been there for about three weeks on the floor, trying to wire all this together. And so there was no way this could travel. She was on strike already from, from, from trying to... You can imagine what, what's happening inside that is all hell because it's full of all these hot computers wiring all this up. So in, um, the inspiration struck, which was we say, OK, it'll travel virtually. So the Arts Council swallowed and said, OK, so long as you put a poster up to, up to each computer it travels to, saying that it was sponsored by the Arts Council. So we quickly printed some posters, sent it to all our friends, said, photograph these quick next to your computer and log into our website. So what we did, we started almost accidentally the first attempt to interact not just with real visitors to the exhibition, but to virtual visitors. So 1995, January, and the internet had only just getting, I mean, I, I know, no one was really using it then, 1995. It's blown up on us on the last eight years. So it involved these three elements, sensing changes to the environment. That is because of my point about the oak tree. I'm, I, I hope I don't have to be too obvious and explain everything. The oak tree obviously is responding to its environment, so this particular seed responds to its environment, which is the environment in the exhibition space, the noise, the smoke, and so on. Visitors, who can switch genetic information, and virtual visitors on the internet. There in the middle of the exhibition were these computers taking information from all over the world, and that is what we were trying to evolve. Those are the sensors looking for smoke, temperature, noise, uh, that's the interaction on the internet. There are very complex evolutionary cycles in this model. Um, just believe me, they're complicated. Uh, and there is the system working. Let me just show you doing this. So um, first of all, um, I know I've just been to the back to look. You can barely see. There are numbers coming in here, which are messages from the internet and the exhibition space and the environment and on the internet. They are controlling the cell splitting here. These are our spherical cells, I explained a moment ago, and they are deciding how to breed and, and how to split on the basis of this information. And here is an ex uh, resultant form. Let me just show that a little bit more close up. Well, it's not going to run for me. Well, you skip that one, never mind. Um, and anyway, this is resultant form. Now, I have to explain, this is a canned animation. So it's combining two of the things that I've been talking about. One is the epigenetic development, the growth, like the tree, the oak from the acorn to the tree. It's also including the notion of evolution over the many, many iterations of the exhibition. Now, what is it evolving for? Well, I have to give away. It's evolving for increasing complexity, that is, increasing number of intersections. That's highly controversial. We get this always that same argument about dolphins. Are dolphins complex or simple? Externally, they're extremely simple. So you could argue this ought to in evolve for increasing simplicity. However, the internal configuration of a dolphin is the most complex mammal on the planet. So in that case, you should be evolving for external complexity. In this case, I mean internal complexity, maybe external simplicity. In this case, if we <laughs> you couldn't see what was happening, so we externalized it. And as it was, the success was it ran, the failure was it was too slow. You couldn't see the result. And I had irate emails from, from people from Japan for months afterwards saying that they changed the genetic information, they couldn't see any change, and so on. Anyway, that was, that is, so that's a canned sequence, both the evolution of this thing over the whole process of the exhibition. But that was an experiment in both local participation and global participation over the internet. Um, secondly, after that, Manit um, then started experimenting with um, having more than one computer talking to each other. So this began a complexity of a network of computers collectively collaborating to co-evolve um, forms. That's important to me, the notion that there is a network of these things out there. Right, to continue with applications, um, I'm going to talk just very briefly about Groningen. Three quick experiments there, one in 96 and two in 2003. These are to do with public participation, meeting with the planners, the citizens of the thing. These are models. There's someone over there whose hand I recognize there. Um, 
and uh, interacting with the models so that people could uh, communicate without having any architectural language. Uh, many, many discussions and uh, inputs. This is a typical diagram I did, which you can see why everyone took some time to understand what we were doing. But it's all about debate and involvement. And this is a very important element, which is how to get the fish, as it were, um, into the system. And here, again, back now to that chemical computer, for example, Orit applied that to them building a cellular automata, which mimicked the growth of the crystals, which then generated a plan, which then generated the three-dimensional form. We call them crystals. I think they're called shards now. Um, and so we model Groningen, the growth of Groningen, running it backwards. This is a, a model, a, a diagram of the whole system, which contains almost all the elements I've been talking about so far. Here is the thing coming in the middle. Out here you have user selection, which is obvious. Neural networks I've been talking about, trying to understand what's happening. Genetic algorithms pushing from here, and the uh, cellular automata actually doing the generation. So all the, all the different elements I've been talking to about now kind of coming together in one, in one diagram. Now we built these responsive models not just for Groningen, but for other cities. So for example, this is Kuala Lumpur. The idea being that the different cities with different economies, different ecologies, different uh, um, environmental conditions would discuss with each other their potential growth. And these are some of the outcomes. In fact, what's happened here is someone su suggested pedestrianizing the center so that the model has come back and said, well, what's likely to happen is that you'll get very high density growth immediately on the sites immediately adjacent and so on. So it's a kind of what-if predictive model, but it learns on the basis of experiments. It's run backwards to understand how Groningen grew historically, which is what that little sequence back here was. This isn't actually Groningen put in, but it's Groningen learning to be itself. And then here you see all those different cities talking to each other. Each of these computers is a different city. Down here is the model which you can physically interact with, and down here are the computers showing the predicted outcomes of different ideas that the citizens are inputting. So this becomes a tool here where both the environment, environmental information is relevant, economic information, user information, everything is combined into uh, one complex model. And it got called the Talking Cities in reference to, to Ron Heron, who sadly died just while we were doing this. Um, Studio 333, who are one of the participants in that experiment, are now using that piece of software I showed fairly near the beginning of the evolving, do you remember the pagodas? About 20 minutes ago. The pagodas, this is what Studio S33 are doing with that. There's a site in Groningen, or actually four sites. Those are the footprints of those four sites. And they're experimenting using the software to evolve um, buildings which, um, which collaborate. In this case, the four sites have decided to coalesce and this particular sequence, they decided to produce one joint form. Um, but of course, each run of the system, you can reward it, decide, or whatever. Um, but this is being run entirely automatically. And S33 are one of, the, one of the, the small number of architectural offices in the world are actually trying using some of this software in anger to build projects. We've also been there building a city in a room, 24-hour experiment. We had a dinner where we wrote instructions all over the tablecloth, which was then left for the next team through the night. And, it, and, and built this layered uh, experiment in, 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 in basically doing it by hand with cardboard and paper or whatever. Um, I keep going back to this. this. This is back to the beach, the computers, you know, the computing without computers. You imagine what would happen, and you simulate it some other way as a kind of, a kind of process of getting out of the machinery. You know you've got all that power there. You know you've got all those techniques there. You have to continually revisit the question of what you're trying to do with it all. So, um, to my surprise, 24 hours later, I thought there'd be nobody left. But to my delight, there were 120 people in the room, of from three are architects, 97 were art artists, and the rest we never discovered what they were. However, they were all having a nice time, and they'd all stayed there all night building these various city archaeologies. But this is to do with emphasizing, again, the, the public participation element in this. Now, some implications. Okay, we're all right. Um, First of all, Walter Siegel. Now, the reason for going back to Walter Siegel is the clarity of this. It's so simple, it's very obvious. Walter Siegel um, designed this very simple, very modest, and the slides are very small to show that, very modest um, timber housing system that builds single-story, double-story houses for self-builders to build their own. These are built in Lewisham by people, basically, who are unemployed, and Lewisham borough subsidized the site and so on. And Walter Siegel built, designed the housing system for them, and he had this model, which he 
talked with the users, trying to get them to become self-designers. The trouble was that he had to be the interpreter always, all the time talking through the model with them. So we basically automated it. Here's an electronic version we built. In the bottom here are little machine-readable things. You can see the circuits here. It's scanned electronically, and so it understands. Each little component, here, a little toilet or whatever, has uh, little electronic components that make the, a, the controlling computer able to understand it. So there is a model, two-story two, house here built two separate stories, scanned by the computer and understood. All the door swings, all the rooms understood. Now, what has happened here? Here's a single-story one. In order to do this, you only have to be able to make a model. You don't have to be able to be an architect. You don't have to be able to draw, even. You don't have to be able to operate a computer. All you have to do is make a model, like making Lego, which any child can manage. So there is the possibility of enabling the self-builders to become self-designers. And so here, it's drawing the structural system for that house, uh, which it's then able to do the calculations on. It's able to cost it and then tell you why, how you can make your house less expensive and so on, because it knows all the elements. Um, there are several things about this. Uh, this is in passing. Siegel, of course, is also dead, sadly, but he's the, one of the first of the last architects in the last hundred years to have a street in London named after him. Um, but, more to the point, he achieved immortality on that ship. This is electro-programmable read-only memory, and Walter's system is forever embedded on that ship, as is Cedric Price's one for Groningen, so that indefinitely, you could theoretically go on building Walter Siegel or Cedric Price buildings. Now, just look at this. Just pause on this slide a moment, because what we're playing with here is changing everybody's roles. The architect, in this case, is not concerned, and I'm sorry about the simplicity of the, of the Walter Siegel example, but it makes it clear, I hope. The architect, instead of designing each individual manifestation, he in, in designs the genetic and generic system. Now, most architects think generically, which is how you know their work. It's how you can recognize a, you know, a, a, a Le Corbusier or a Frank Lloyd Wright or a Peter Salter building. It's because there are, there are common elements which are clearly identifiable. That's the generic thinking. What we're implying here is you should capture that as genetic information and put it into seeds. The next thing is that the user here plays a more active role in establishing their precedence, uh, pre preferences and in interacting. The environment becomes an active participant in this process, not particularly in the Walter Siegel example, but in the other examples I've been talking about. The whole means of construction change, as with uh, both what I was talking about with Ron Holland and the day-by-day -day more interactive systems I was showing a moment ago, and the computer isn't some dumb drafting system, but becomes the evolutionary accelerator, because otherwise all this is going to take too long. Think how long nature takes to do anything. Um, we have a word for this, which is a made-up word, autotectonics. And my view of the future of all this is that the natural and artificial environments will merge. That is, there will be an actual physical interaction between the two. I mean this very literally, and that we plug back into nature, the buildings, and the nature plugs back into the building in a genuine two-way form of reciprocity. And that is achieved through these computer tools. And that's how the word was derived. I didn't like the word architect, archdevil, archdeacon. It's all about control freaks. Auto is to do with self, independence, and so on. And I just found this a much more attractive word. So politically, ecologically, environmentally, uh, I want to develop auto tectonics. Now, we come to the whole point. We're half, we're not, well, we're halfway through the argument. We're not halfway through the time. We're nearly finished. Don't worry. But I'm back on the beach. Uh, because I'm now going to turn the whole lecture backwards. First of all, I've been borrowing heavily from nature and, and environmental theory and natural science. But actually, couldn't we do better? Uh, anyway, how do we get back to the seed? And anyway, I've gradually discovered after 30 years of doing this, actually natural science doesn't have a clue how this works themselves. The, the, the vast... Um, gaps in understanding in natural sciences are quite terrifying. So, 
we'll start the thought experiment all over again, but this time backwards. We're sitting back on our beach, doing our, it's the best place to do a thought experiment. And first of all, advanced evolution. Um, based, we started from the analogy, but we don't have to follow this because we already started to suggest that we could accelerate this in some way. Now this is the problem, that nature has all the time in the world. It can take forever. It's taken billions of years. And I've never forgotten um, Alvin Boyarsky, who went to the first crit of our units when we showed that um, universal constructor, that thing with the cubes, saying, well, this is fascinating, John, but I suppose the first six billion years of evolution were pretty bloody boring to watch, um, but a good time to be around. And, and I kind of rubbed it home that we got a problem about the speed. We can't take all the time in the world. We've got real clients, real, and we've got a real environmental crisis on our hands. Something has to be done to accelerate this. And so, the way nature works is, is obscene. Profligate prototyping makes billions of experiments, most of which fail, which just become food for the rest. Um, it's, this is where I get... This is where, when I give this lecture in America, everyone jumps up and shouts at me. I say, it's blind, slow, mindless, ruthless, a moral directionless, purposeless, and every illusionary step has to work. By which I mean you can't get halfway to a giraffe. Now, we don't have most of these problems. Um, if you happen to believe in God, then, of course, you can cross out the whole of that line. Uh, however, you just have to explain why he's making it a cock-up most of the time. Anyway. Um, so natural evolution works like this, series of cycles. We have crossover of the genes, we have generation, and we have selection in an environment. And this goes on and on cyclically over millions and millions and millions of years. Now, could we advance on that? Now, first of all, we've got a different problem. First of all, um, our purpose is different, our means of manufacture. We don't make things with proteins, not yet, um, which is difficult for a start. Our time scale is different. And we, we have resource implementation. We have to get things done in, in, in tens of years, or even ones of years, not millions of years. But we do have imagination, foresight, anticipation of consequences, and we can compress evolutionary space and time with this little toy of mine. And so, the advanced evolutionary cycle, we can cheat. We can do all the things that nature can't do. We can affect the embryogeny, we can ex affect success by nurture, we can pass back experience. Um, Lamarckian inheritance, really good idea. Pity nature couldn't do it. Brilliant. Why get rid of it? Put it back. Quick. Unnatural selection, of course, interfere with genetic information, and so on. So we don't have to be trapped into an analogy which we started out with if we're building this as a tool. Right back to the very beginning. This is where I started. Um, I, I, I had taken this out of the lecture, but I put it back in the end because it's such a very simple example. But this time I'm going to tell the story backwards. I started this in 1968. Simple little structural system, makes lots of little complicated shapes with just two components. Um, I had great difficulty drawing this because those models, there were several thousand of these units, so I first started using computers and discovered what an absolute pain they were. There was no AutoCAD there, there was no software. You had to program every little line tediously in Fortran. It took forever. Um, and the, the AA didn't have a computer at all in those days. And of course there were no screen graphics, so you had to plot everything using these vast um, pieces of 18th century machinery, but out came computer drawings which produced the perspectives and things that I was struggling to do by hand. However, I was far too lazy to go on putting all that data in, so I saw both the potential of the computer and the frustration in 66. So, I decided the way to do it was to seed it. Now, the way I normally tell this lecture is logical. That is, that we start with a seed and we grow it, which sounds fine. So here we go, here we're here we on the screen. That's a little graphic representation of that device growing. So all these processes are automatic. That is, sorry, that seed, I should explain, is the first attempt I, I did to do what I was talking about, about making the packet of seeds and the spinach. That is a minimum configuration of those structural units that makes a closed shape. And then you just simply mutate and grow and develop that on the computer screen, the little maneuvers here for shapes. In those days, you couldn't show too many of these on the screen at the time, which is fortunate now because it means it's very easy to see what's happening. So we now have a quite different design model. Here is our data structure. But instead of putting all the data in tediously by hand, we seed it with a very simple data structure. And then we have a cultivation program and around and round and round, like growing the oak tree. We become more like a gardener. And so here we see it growing, developing. Now, this is at Cambridge University. At Cambridge, at 1970, the only output device that had one graphics output device, a circular cathode ray tube, and it drew round and round by refreshing. So if you had too many lines, the first ones had faded before you got to the end. 
and it's a real computer with little flashing lights and things. But there were two points about this. One is that we had to find some way of expressing this very economically because there was still very little computing power. And the other one, and for those who are interested in life game, John Horton Conway, who invented the life game, is the only other person using this thing, and we shared this every night, this machine, for four years. So there's considerable interaction, which is probably obvious. So if you look at something like this, you will find that probably or possibly you can see up here is the residual element of those seeds. Whoops, sorry. There's other outputs from the same program. So now there's something like two to 5,000 units typically in these drawings, but I haven't had to put any more in than the initial 32. So far, so good. However, I'm explaining that as if we got to the seed. Now, in fact, the way I had been doing it was like this. First, I had to build myself a special purpose drawing board, which had hexagonal coordinates in order to put these in as integers. We'll skip all that. But having built this device, I was then able to put these things in in this very coded form. And this became my first coded DNA script, because that uniquely describes this unit in space and its position. And so we have one of those for each of the 8,000. So the building, that first unit, looks like that. It gets expanded like that. And then that becomes the piece of genetic code for that. So this is the start of the code script of that building you've just seen. That is described in those terms. And so by manipulating, you can get that. Now the problem was this, you see. I'm explaining very logically. You get from the C to the building. However, my problem was I got the building. How did I get back to the seed? And that's what caused me all the mental effort. In order to be exquisitely lazy, I had to go through this extremely painful process of going backwards. But suddenly I realized the whole point of this is that really we want to get back to that in a generalized way. How do we get back to that seed in everything we're talking about? Here's a later example of that same thing with the spheres. These are little models developing and growing which turn into a three-dimensional model of one of the structures you've just seen. That's going through this whole cell-splitting process, having finally got to understand it properly. That's what we were trying to do. The problem is, what is the process? But before I go back to that, I'm going to pose that as a question to you, I just want to talk briefly about embedding intentionality. Because in order to get these buildings and environments I'm talking about interacting with nature, we have to embed our interaction, inter intelligence, self-knowledge, self-assembly into, into the very fabric. How are we going to do that? Of course, I can embed chips, like we were suggesting for, for Cedric Price, but that's, that's not a really sustainable long-term solution. Anyway, nature can't read the chips. Now, this is a very nice little thing that one of my students discovered, which is those are, those are the close-packing spheres that we were delighted by. Now, there is a layer of them, just one layer. Now, that's the layer above, but look carefully at this slide. Do you see here, the, the develop, these balls have been displaced to develop to deliberately leave a fault line. I don't know if you can see that from the back. There's a fault line now. I hope that's clear as a dislocation of the pattern. Now, something very interesting happens when you put the next layer of balls in. That fault closes. That's, that's one more layer up that model. The fault was under here. It's now closed, so it's self-repaired. But even more interesting, if you build the next layer, the fault reoccurs. So here we have an example of a self-replicating system in physical form. Now this is very important because if you're talking about evolution, there's a big question missing. Where did DNA evolve from? Where did we get the DNA? I mean, assuming you don't believe it came from Mars or something. Um, oh, where did the DNA come from? Now, it had to evolve from some simpler replicating mechanism. And Can Smith and others believe this is a mineral replication in clay or whatever. Now, this is an actual way it could be done. Here, Nicola has cast that in rubber, and that's the fault, the dislocation. Now, faults are very important to me. Continuity of information is no information. If you have endless crystal structure, that is that's white noise. All the information, all the information, all the interest resolves in differences, dislocations, faults, errors. That is where everything rests. That is where the information is. So I got very interested in the notion of faults and dislocations in crystal structure as being the embedded information. I can tell you very quickly and excitedly that when you start doing this in three dimensions, they start to replicate. 
you start to get complex three-dimensional structures growing, not in the structures. People are looking at the wrong thing. They looked at the damn crystal structures. Forget that. It's the faults. Just look at the errors where it dislocated. That's the information. That's what everyone had missed all the time. So I think this is a very fruitful line of inquiry. So now, what happens if we try to reverse the whole analogy? And this is speculation at this point. Not, there's no answer at the end of this. So if you're hoping for an answer, the answer is you've got to go away and think about it. Can we reverse the analogy? <coughs> Instead of worrying about how we get from the seed to the plant, which nature, and natural scientists can't tell you, the explanation about developmental biology, first of all, developmental biology, a relatively new science, didn't even bother Darwin, and <coughs> it's relatively new science, and it's very badly understood. You look, by, go into Dylan's and buy any book on developmental biology and see if you think you've got a clear example of how, explanation of how you get from that seed to that plant, or from the oak <laughs> to the acorn. Now, what I'm trying to do is go back the other way. You are designers. You are used to dealing with this problem the other way round. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm suggesting that we can give something back to natural science. I, I'm just briefly blow my old trumpet. I hope you don't mind it. I, I'm very flattered by the, by the amount of attention I've been getting in scientific books on all kinds of things like the philosophy of science, um, things to do with algorithms, genetic algorithms, and so on. There's a lot of space, and recently some of my work was used in the, the, the Royal Academy, um, uh, sorry, the Royal Society, uh, a, a, as a kind of explanation, because they've suddenly begun to realize that designers have actually got something to offer. Now, I haven't got the answer to this, but everyone in the world, this is the room, everyone, all of you can participate in this experiment. I'm going to leave this hanging at the end of the lecture. Total frustration. The question to all of you is this. Can you reverse it? Can, if you, were the, if you wanted to generate the seed from which that oak tree would grow, how would you code those instructions as an architect? That is your blueprint. Well, we have already explained it's a bad analogy, but okay, there, there are the instructions. There are the coded instructions. Write the instructions in for that acorn to grow that oak. Bearing in mind, it also is environmentally sensitive. It depends on the plants around it. How do we get from the tadpole back to the single cell of the frog spawn? Now, if you, as an could do this, we, we, we would make an immense impact in the world of science. And I don't think the way they're going about this is going to get them anywhere. So I think this is a design problem, and therefore it's right back in our domain to address it. So my question, how do we get to the polyp? How do we get backwards, or how do we get backwards from the, coral, from the, from the Great Barrier Reef to the polyp? And conversely, how do you get from the polyp up to the barrier reef? If you decide your job is to design the Great Barrier Reef, right, this is your problem for the night. And, and what you're going to do is write the instructions for the polyp in DNA. I, now, this is really fascinating. Well, it fascinates me. It bores you. That's too bad. Um, I, 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 I throw this down as a challenge to get this backwards. So there is your thought experiment. This is my last slide. You're back on your beach. It's a thought experiment. Not only am I suggesting that we have a great deal to learn about nature, but that we've already done so much damage that we have to develop some new interactivity with nature in a way such that nature and ourselves are genuine participants in the developmental processes. And I speculate that maybe, maybe we have to use the r rapidity of development um, of the computer as the only way of solving this problem. Otherwise, I'm back to my dinosaur analogy. After the dinosaurs, the whales, and the elephants, it's you, us. I mean, bear in mind that, that most, of, most of nature we can't see anyway. I mean, we, we, we're just redundantly, ridiculously too big. Um, and so there's a problem there. Uh, uh, but whatever might motivate anyone to get concerned with this problem. I also think it's to do with um, a professional kind of um, um, pride to be able to, 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 to c capitalize well, on this growing interest in the natural science and science community in the way designers think creatively about new problems. Remember. They only ever discover the explanations to phenomena which already exist. We are skilled at the exact reverse. Could we not turn this to our advantage? So I leave you all with a question. Can you work backwards and, as designers, conceive of how you would code a seed, a piece of frog spawn, an acorn, a spinach seed, to get to the plant and 
having done that, can you explain the developmental process by which that growth occurs, which is the thing which natural science is so abysmally failing to do at the moment? And if you don't want to involve my thought experiment, I hope you can get something from the first part of the lecture, which is a suggestion about how you can accelerate your own design methods and perfect the laziness to which I aspire. Any questions? Well, there are many people who would like to say that it's not incorrect to describe nature as a computational system. Um, those people who are interested in computation and, and aren't, don't see it just as bits of electronics and a box of tricks, but see it as a kind of mental process, are very comfortable with this idea. DNA, in interacting with the environment, is going through what can more loosely describe as a computational process. Um, I'm not totally comfortable with talking about it that, that way, but it's a way of bridging this gap. So um, nature is already, in that sense, an extremely powerful computer and has vast resources, huge networks of communities of things. I mean, just look at the way termites build their termite nests, these incredibly elegant, self-ventilated structures. You know, who's, how, do they, how do they collaborate on all these extraordinary kind of thoughts? So they, there has to be some kind of collective intelligence in there, which you can see as of kind of advanced forms of computation. And I say it, it's almost impossible to conceive yet of how, uh, how f for all the science fiction freaks telling us about the fact that the Tottenham Court Road is about to overtake us, um, that I'm not convinced by this for one minute because everything in there got to there through the senses. It got there through my eyes, through my felt, through my touch, through everywhere. How are you going to get that information into the computer and everything you learn? That's a very difficult problem, and, and it's, it's non-trivial. I mean, it, it's no good just saying you'll provide senses for the computer, because how do you interpret this information and so on? So I'm partly saying that the, all the system is out there. The other side of the question is you, you're also, I think, suggesting that we don't have enough power yet, which is also true, and that's bugged me all the way through. However, that is the elegance of having the computer, ex the experiment, the thought experiment of computing without computers which is you think it through without bothering. You know, don't bother with all the inconvenience of the wretched machine. You, know. you can do the thought experiment without touching a computer. M much the better for it. Um, and in fact, that's where most of the people involved in this did it. The other thing worth mentioning is that the two major pioneers of computing, um, that's Turing and von Neumann, both were interested primarily in building computers as a form of simulation of natural growth processes and biological processes. That's how Turing started out, and, uh, and he saw a direct um, correlation between a computer. He got sidetracked then and had to use it to decode war messages and things, and you know, trajectories for bombs or whatever. But, I mean, that's nonsense. The, the real thing, if you actually read, which is something, I, one thing I message everyone, he said, please go and read Darwin. You know, please go and actually read what Turing said. You get a real shock when you find what these people actually said. And you find he's batting on about cow spots. You know, this book about computing, supposedly. And van Neumann, the same, self-replication, you know, the, the idea of self-creative systems. So you know, the, the, the connection is there. This bridge, you know, the, you don't have to believe or, or agree with me. I, I, it's not the kind of lecture you have to agree with. It's, it's a kind of, because I'm interested not in, I don't see a goal out there, a target. I just see a kind of general direction. I'm a sailor. We don't quite know where America is, but you know, we can do better than Columbus. And, you know, he's trying to find India and found America by mistake. So, <laughs> that's the biggest navigational cock-up in history, actually. 7,000 miles out. Spectacular. 
Um, but, but the general direction. And so one of the things when we ran a unit was to say, we're going roughly in that direction, but you can go that way and go out there. And the rules used to be that everyone just stayed sufficiently close together to everyone to be able to understand what each other were talking about and see the relevance of it. So you don't have to agree, but just if there's anything in there you want to take, take it. Um, if you don't, leave it. Well, before, before I give another question, can I, do anybody else want to? Sorry, do you want to come back? Quick one, quick response. Well, I'd, I'd stick with human reproduction. Igor Alexander, who's the expert in this, um, says that humans, you know, human reproduction is, is, is really the most satisfactory you know, method. It's very cheap, um, and it's a lot of fun, and, and, and so on, right? There's, there's, a, there's a long list. You know, why bother to do it artificially? Well, the answer really is, is, to, do, is to do with dealing with systems that are themselves artificial. And the problem only occurs because that buildings are themselves artificial artifacts. And if we could, if we could bridge this gap, that's what I'm really talking about. Um, and, and, and difficult for me to find examples to make this bridge, except in your imagination, or everyone to make their own bridges, um, to see that there isn't actually a difference between uh, our kind of um, uh, reproduction of artificial intelligence, natural intelligence. Um, what's wrong with it? Um, what's wrong with it, I think, is it, it, we are so good at all kinds of problems, about generalizing, global thinking. Okay. But what we're, not, we're not very good at simple things like fast arithmetic. That's pretty boring anyway. Leave that to the machine. You know? We're not very good at churning out endless plans. Leave that to the machine. You know? but, you know, but, but don't let the machine do things you're good at. And don't pretend the machine is good at things that you are better at it at. Um, and, and don't relax control. So my, as far as my model, we are still firmly in control. I sometimes have a private problem, which is the extent to which um, I would perhaps rather nature, since we're making such a mess of it, let nature take over and leave us post-humanist, leave humans out of the equation. But I'm not quite ready to do that yet, perhaps. And the other thing, no, I, that's too long an answer, I'll stop that. I think other people ask questions. Yes, absolutely, because, because of course, th 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 it's now understood quite clearly that not all the information can come from the genetic information in DNA, that there are all kinds of other things to do with like crystal structures, to do with natural forces, to do with external um, things, the things that form ice crystals, that form bubbles, just blowing soap bubbles, um, the self-organizing systems there, um, which have got nothing to do with DNA. And of course, it, of course there, w there, there used to be an idea, you kept these apart. There were systems like crystals and ice, ice crystals and whatever, fluoride on one end, and there were people and plants at the other. Th this is now understood, this is, not a, this is not a useful division, because in the development of the genetic information, in my posed question, which is I'm, I'm claiming, I hope there's some developmental biologists here. I feel like a rumor. Uh, uh, who, who, I'm saying that they can't explain this process. But what is all understood, and there are people like Kaufman writing very elegantly about the way in which we must also take into account self-organizing systems, emergent systems, emergent properties, natural forces which do with things like sand dunes, obviously don't have any genetic information, are also part of that process. The question might be also that there might be genetic information in the sand dunes. That's the point posed by this question. How did the DNA evolve? If you can answer that question, you've got a Nobel Prize. I've asked six questions tonight which could get you a Nobel Prize. You know, work on it. Um, I'm getting too old, but, you know, someone in the audience might do it. Good luck. Any other questions? Um, well, I'm not really trying to show form. I'm trying to talk about process. Um, 
Um, th there is a problem, isn't there? Okay, you've touched on a tricky problem, which is, which I'm told to talk about process without showing images or form. However, it's impossible to say anything if I don't show some images to engage you. If you happen to find the images interesting, that's a side, that's a side effect. It actually has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. However, you are very welcome to try and use some of those tools, and you can put the sexiness in to derive the kind of results um, you want. I, 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 I took out the slides of some of these systems having a kind of, you know, bad hairdo day. And, you know, um, because, I mean, they do produce the most awful things, too. And there's a lot of self-selection. And I said, oh, my Chinese programmers prefer these pagoda-like things, which I'm not too keen on. But, but otherwise, I have to go. But you have to understand my rule. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tool builder. If I go in and play my game, of course, the, the, may, the, the, the day may change when I retire from tool making to using my own tools, but I'm trying to put that off as long as possible, because once I start doing that, the tool-making process is dead. You know? Do you understand what I mean? I, I can't make the distance to trying to generalize. I'll be doing specificities, but of course that's very tempting, and of course from time to time. But what I like doing most is working with other people, like SS Studio 333 or Ken Yang or whoever, to do something using these tools for specific manifestation or, or particularly um, Walter Siegel, and most particularly of all, Cedric Price, who, as far as I was concerned, was the perfect person to work with because his frameworks were so loose but so highly su suggestive. So you, you're very welcome to play. They're very powerful tools. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, that diagram, that little matrix I showed where, um, where you've got four major options is crucial. Let me just, let me just flick to that quickly. Um, because you, you really have a choice over this, um, which is whether you want to converge on one type of solution or whether you want to diverge. Now, we learned a long time ago that if you show convergence on something, slow convergence, it's really uh, not very... Uh, stimulating to watch. So there's a tendency um, to kind of turn up the mutation. I can't even stop the thing. My God, thank you. Who is that? Somebody on the ball. Oh, anyway. Thank you very much. There you are. That diagram, what you're really asking for is, is to go into this convergence sector. Um, we don't really know. You see, I mean, the, 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 the genetic modification people want to go there and only there. Um, many people, though, are worrying that about the question as to why there is so much residual and apparently useless information in DNA. I mean, like about 95% of it. And it, it, it seems to be that it's there to cope with sudden changing situations so that it can diverge. But my reason mainly for showing divergent things is because it looks more fun. And it's back to his point about the images, right? Uh, if I show it getting slowly and slower, if I show you a yacht, you know, 50 slides later, it's got three millimeters narrower. You know, you, you'll all go home. So, uh, uh, but of course, in a useful sense, you may well want to be in that, in that sector at some point. Uh, so what I'm saying is you usually use a balance of these. So, yes, th th that criticism is quite valid, but is to do with the presentation of a lecture rather than the thinking behind it. It gets eaten. No, it gets eaten. If, if you get eaten before you reproduce, you know, you, you've got a mate before you're eight, mate. Yeah. You know? No, no, exactly. That's the, that's the whole problem. And, and that's why, why on the other slide later I said, well, you could use the mark in inheritance so you'd know about that and could anticipate. It's all kind of shortcuts we can take, which nature can't do because of the process it's stuck with. 
Um, now, and that's not a criticism of nature. I, you know, I get people leaping up in the audience, either complaining because they're religious and hate what I'm saying from that point of view, or be claiming, I'm complaining, I, I, I'm, I'm improving on nature. No, I'm saying we're dealing with a different problem. We take what we want, but if we're doing it, we don't have to follow slavishly the, the, the actual techniques. Um, no, the way it works is like this. There's a whole room full of people, like millions of us, and, and uh, some divergence that uh, un, you know, w will, will be then be favored. There's always um, two kinds of divergence of quirk. One is a quirk of sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is more important than people think in terms of producing new variants. The other is slight random mutations, which has been overestimated, possibly. And we put very, very, to give you some idea, we, we, we normally put the random number generator at something like 0.001%, that kind of amount, just to get out of a tr possible trap, right, an eco trap, or, a, or environmental or a, a developmental trap, right? So uh, you don't never know that. You know, well, you don't know, but you get it. He knows, he at you. Because he, 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 he mated before you, and his offspring happened to have, you know, had a successful variant, you know, he's... Yes, but, if, but the point is this. The point is this, though. If you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if you've got a vast um, range of genes, the chances of, the, of, a, of a useful variant, because if it's become very, very special, the, the worry, I'm sorry, I'm not a, I must be careful what I'm saying. I'm, a, I'm outside my own territory here, but as, my, as I understand the genetic modification argument is this, that it produces such a narrow set of genes that if there is some environment, it, it cannot generate something outside that set. Therefore, it will die. Right, that's the argument being advanced. I, I'm, I, I, I have no expertise in this argument. However, that sounds to me a remarkably plausible argument. Diversity, biodiversity, sounds to me like a good idea. You know, like a, diver a pluralism of ideas. Wouldn't it be awful if everyone in this room agreed with me? You know? Oh, you no. Know, there's going to be a pluralism of, of different ideas and reactions, and, and that's what causes something to happen. Uh, sorry, two different things. Sorry, let, let me. Sorry, let me. The, 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 the symmetry thing is different to the errors in the packing of crystals, information errors. The symmetry is what's left over. Nature starts off spherically symmetrical. It goes on dividing and becoming more and more asymmetrical. That's one process. The other is the errors, the, the, the close packing errors in that in a crystal structure. You have to remember DNA is a crystal technically. Um, you should read Schrodinger, What is Life? Wonderful book. I should have produced a bibliography for this lecture. My, my, you know, the things I wished everyone would read, because they're so exciting to actually read what the guy, right, what Schrodinger. Schrodinger described the notion of what DNA must be like long before anyone had any idea. It was wonderful pieces, pure thought experiment. It's pure speculative thinking. And, and that led to the actual discovery of DNA structure. Now, um, that embedding of information is to do with my looking at two things. I'm looking for two different things. I'm looking for the, uh, an answer to the question how DNA evolved, because that interests me intellectually as a general question about life. More specifically, I'm looking at a way of embedding instructions. I want this glass to be literally intelligent. Right? Everything around us is getting more and more intelligent. You know, how many times you shouted at your toaster because it's not smart enough to turn the, you know, burns it? Because things got the wrong kind of intelligence, or they, or they, or they make assumptions about, oh, wrong. I mean, this is kind of, it's so banal at the moment. But everything is going to be intelligent and adjust automatically. We've already got high levels of this, even in a telephone in our pocket. Vast amounts of, but embedded assumptions made by somebody else usually, the programmer, not learnt from you. So the first thing it's got to learn from you. But then another question is, how do you get it, not into some computer chip, but into the actual fabric? I want this glass t to know about my reaction and be able to uh, reconfigure itself accordingly and so on, and to be able to pass that information to the bottle I put it down next to and so on. It should, of course, you know, topped itself up or whatever, you know? I mean, it, we, we we're looking for something far beyond current levels of, of so-called smart products, you know, watches and clocks and all the digital stuff around us in Topical Road. That's just the beginning, not the end. It's just the very tip of the, you know. But isn't it difficult to project ahead? We all know the keyboard and the mouse are, are daft, but, but how many people can really imagine what will be on the shelf in even five years' time, ten years' time? It's very difficult. We all think of ourselves as being highly imaginative, creative. Yet it takes pause. Remember, 96% goat and 30% spinach. Can't expect much. 
Any, any, more, any more questions? There's one at the back there, sorry. So can you shout or come a bit closer or stand up or something? I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think we should end on this because the first part of what you said is absolutely correct. That we, uh, all this depends on how you select and who sets up the selection criteria, which is part of the notion of the, of the somebody seeding it and part of the notion of the interaction with the climate and the environment and the population. So that's part of that and that's crucial. But your other part is, is, is Im embedded in the kind of frustration you feel when the wretched computer goes and makes some assumption about what you want to do you don't know about, and you can't find where it did it or where it set the... You know, now, that is a very real worry because the kind of people who are involved in programming these systems have a particular kind of mindset with which I cannot associate, by and large. And I think that's very frightening. So I leave it on that. That's why I think... Everyone in this room should not leave this to anybody else to do. Don't leave this to some dumb programmer, you know. Don't have to do the programming yourself, but get in there and start to make theoretical and philosophical comment on what it ought to be like before you get exactly the problem. You've put your finger absolutely on one of the most frightening um, potential future trajectories. That's, that's one quick way to go down the dinosaur route. I think we should stop. Thank you.